And all right, IU fans, look, uh, things are moving. Things are happening fast and furious. The the this is the the season is starting now. The season started last week. It didn't start in November. That's that's a myth. Okay, the actual basketball, Indiana will get around to that at some point. Uh, it's portal season, and it's hot, and it's happening. The women's team can keep playing. They're doing all right. They're half decent, in case you may not have, in case you may not have heard yet. But Matt and I are going to go through the list of 20, 20 prospects that Indiana has reportedly connected with in the transfer portal. We're going to highlight a couple of them that we like, talk about their games, discuss what they could mean to the Hoosiers if Mike Woodson is able to land and seal the deal with these players. So Matt and I are going to dive into those players. We're going to talk a little transfer out, right, with Gunn and Banks and Sparks. And, of course, we're going to touch on Terry Morin's team making the Sweet 16 and so much more here on Episode 325 of the Hoosier Sound for we're the official podcast of Indiana HQ. We're recording this edition of the Hoosier Sound on Tuesday, March 26th, 2024, where I'm your host, Nathan Christian. Here with me tonight is my normal co-host, Matt Lukens. Matt, Indiana's on it. You know, we're seeing the Hoosiers reach out to transfers and get their name into the hat for a large number of these guys. 20 players the Hoosiers have connected with as recently as about an hour ago, where the Hoosiers are one of the first teams to connect with Iowa transfer Tony Perkins from Lawrence North. Matt, as you look through the guys that Indiana has connected with, what are some of the themes that you're seeing the Hoosiers go after? What do you think are one or two of the main objectives Mike Woodson is looking for as he goes out and contacts these potential newcomers? Uh, shooting. I think that is, I mean, music to my ears, but also just like very obvious if you're looking at the, the portal guys. I mean, most of the guys have about 35% plus from three. Um, most of the guys average are right around, you know, 12 to 18 points per game at their program. Um, a lot of absolute ballers. I can't wait to go into more detail about a lot of these guys. Um, and a significant amount of them have ties to the IU program, whether it's Jalen Blackman that just hit the the portal. Obviously, both his brothers played at IU. Or Connor Hickman, who we'll talk about, who's visiting this weekend, who's from Bloomington. Or people just like Javon Small, um, who's from Indianapolis. Or, or um, Leland Walker, who's from Indianapolis and grew up an Indiana fan. Um, these guys, you know, they, they have some connection to the program. They're not reaching out to just everybody. Um, they haven't just handed out an offer to every single player, like it's Arkansas. Right. <laughs> but I think they've so far, they have picked the best transfers that are in the portal have heard from Indiana for the most part, unless, uh, they, you know, there's been, you know, obviously rumors or, or some tampering in the other way. Um, but I, I, I like the selection that Indiana has right now. A lot of guys that um really killed it at like a mid-major level that are really good guards. And I think, you know, for college basketball, and you look at the, the way the tournament went the first weekend, a lot of these guys um that have been killing it for, for a lot of these programs, um, even the high major ones, have either been transfers from yeah. the mid-major level or were, you know, at a mid-major school, right, and, and absolutely killing it. Um, and, and, and kind of showed off their craft against some bigger schools this weekend or this past weekend. And, and there's a lot of talent, um, that thanks to the transfer portal, <laughs> a lot of these guys have been able to go down a level or, or, um, were kind of under recruited and ended up at the mid-major level and are showing out and now get their chance to kind of take a step up. Um, so I, f I feel like most of the portal was actually guards, which is good for Indiana because again, you have hopefully two forwards and Trey Galloway coming back from the starting lineup last year. So you could really use two guards, um, uh, out of the, you know, out of the portal and there's a lot to select from. 
so much to select from. I think the most recent report from Jeff Goodman is that the number of transfers is up in the 900s now since the portal opened up back on the Monday after Selection Sunday on March 18th. Let's run through the list at a very high level. Um, we're going to sort this by height. <laughs> height? We're sorting this by height? We're sorting this by height. Uh, tallest to shortest. So uh, Malik Dia from Belmont, Frankie Fiddler from Nebraska Omaha, Michael Ajayi from Pepperdine, Cade Tyson from Belmont, Dakota LaFue from Mount St. Mary's, Tony Perkins from Iowa, Marcus Foster from Furman, Devontae Davis from Arkansas, hey, Devo Davis, Connor Esesian from Wisconsin, Javon Small from Oklahoma State, Connor Hickman from Bradley, Kanan Carlisle from Stanford, Dayton Albury from Queens, Trey Dinkins from Canisius, Deshaun Jackson from Charlotte, Jackson's off to Iowa State now, Amari Williams from Drexel, Drexel Clark Slykert from UPenn, Jacoby Gillespie from Belmont, Leland Walker from Eastern Kentucky, and Jordan Sears from Tennessee Martin. Shout out to Tony Andrenia, who uploaded the latest and greatest information on IUPortalDractor.com. And I highly recommend those of you who pay attention, close attention to IU basketball to head over. The upside updates pretty quickly. Um, it's got a few different buckets as far as the different players that Indiana is pursuing. Looks like a couple of guys have visit scheduled. Matt mentioned Connor Hickman, Leland Walker as well, who also, uh, who hails from Indianapolis. Um, the fact of the matter here is, Matt, Indiana has seven scholarship spots Yep, that they're trying to fill. That's assuming Mackenzie Mbako comes back. Khalil wears off to the NBA. The Hoosiers have seven spots to fill. So I use at least taking the correct first step in getting their name into the hat, into the conversation with a large number of these guys. Connor Hickman's visiting this weekend, Matt. If he doesn't commit by Monday, I'm going to be stuck. Right? Bloomington be, South guy. Bloomington <laughs> South. I believe he played high school basketball with Leal, right? Exactly. Yes. I mean, you know, you as you start thinking about potential guys who uh, who will join this team in the near future, um, I would not be shocked if he was the first one. I think Peyton Sparks is the first transfer uh, last year for Indiana. Uh, I would expect it to be Connor Hickman. <laughs> right after he's done visiting campus uh, this weekend. I'm surprised he even needs to visit. He's probably been there probably 15, 20 times. Yeah, he's um, from Bloomington. He, this is his <laughs> home. Like, what do you think? I guess, I guess uh, maybe he gets a little bit better access to, like, the weight room. And, uh, you know, it's uh, it's in all its glory right now after the, the women's team made the best use of Assembly Hall you could possibly make. So uh, you sort of bask in the success uh, of, of that a couple of, uh, uh, yeah. you know, a, a few days later. Um, you know, <laughs> Leland Walker, you know, indie guy, Eastern Kentucky. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be shocked if his commitment came a little bit after as well. Connor you, Sijin, yeah, Connor Season, right, in-state guy. It's just there's been a little bit of rumblings the entire time a season was at Wisconsin. Hey, Indiana would be a good fit. Indiana would be a good fit. I don't think Mike Woodson should overthink this. Um, and again, even if you get three guys, that leaves four or five that you still have to land. Uh, you were talking about some of the mid-major guys impacting teams across the country. I mean, just look at the Big Ten, right? You had Ryan Langborg doing big things at Northwestern, Lance Jones and Marcus Domask really Marcus Damask really helping Illinois. Uh, and yeah. that's just, you know, that's just on the surface. That's gonna get into a guy like Tyson Walker, who's been so critical for Michigan State after his time at Northeastern. That's exactly the type of player Indiana is looking for. And again, all those guys do things, do it differently, right? Like Tyson Walker is the alpha guard, you know, may, you know, could Leland Walker be that if he comes to Indiana, uh, Ryan Langboard's out on the perimeter and then he can add a little bit more to the game. Uh, could that be Connor Hickman who does, who does something very similar to Bradley? So you've got to see how these pieces fit together. That's got to be the number one objective from Mike Woodson as he, as he goes through this process. As I look at this, Malik Dia from Belmont really stands out. I mean, he's going to be one of the best transfers available in this process. 6'9", stretch four from Belmont. His name constantly popped up in different statistical searches that I was doing, different uh, different games that I was hopping around over the course of the season. That guy knows how to ball. He has multiple years of eligibility left, too. Of course, we'll see what happens as far as the NBA for Malik Dia, but Indiana just had success with a player like that, didn't they? Khalil Ware, yeah. somebody who 
Uh, of course, had a little bit of a different background at Oregon, but multiple years of eligibility, NBA prospect. Hey, Louis Dia, Kill Aware is a pretty good uh, path for you to follow if you're if you're interested in interested in that uh, interested in that process. Um, I'm curious about uh, Dayton Alberry, uh, the guy from Queens. He's a very, very fascinating background. I believe there's JUCO history in there. I believe yep. he grew up in the Bahamas. Uh, it's a it's a little bit of a roundabout, uh, interesting uh, journey uh, that Dayton Alberry has taken uh, to Queens College. Of course, Queens uh, Queens University. I'm sorry, is uh, new to D1. So you know that's another another little wrinkle in the whole thing. Uh, but as I was taking a look at Dayton Alberry's game, I said, "Oh man, I could see, I could see that being an interesting uh, addition to this team. Somebody who." In the in the thick of Big Ten play, could create some easy offense for your team. He spent some yeah. time with Sunrise Christian as well, um, you know, in that in that chance to sort of grow, uh, you know, grow his game. Uh, and then of course, I looked at the free throw and the three point number: seventy five percent from the line, thirty six percent from three. Uh, I will my, I wouldn't mind taking that every day of the week, including the six rebounds per game. So as I look at this, I see Dayton Allberry is a fascinating guy, Malik Dia. But Matt, you know, Indiana has a lot of spots to fill. As you look at, as you look at the different guys the Hoosiers went after, uh, who who are a couple of guys in the portal that Indiana has reportedly gotten into contact with that stand out to you? Oh, I mean, in first name off the board for me. I mean, you said Malik Dia. I think he's great. I just don't know. I don't know about the fit with him, Renew, and Mbako. I feel like they all try to do similarish things. Um, and it, and it's just too much on the same roster. Cade Tyson is a name that immediately jumps off the page for me. Immediately, yeah. immediately. Six, seven wing, 46% three point shooter on 172 attempts this year. Okay. And he shoots 50% from the right wing, 50% on catch and shoot threes. He's in the 98th percentile on spot ups. 98. You know how hard it is to be in the 98th percentile? I, I think, actually, wait, no, I might be lying. That might be Hickman. Hickman <laughs> might be 98th percentile on spot ups, but I think he's still like the 93rd percentile, which is absurd. Um, that is so hard to do. Brother of Hunter um, Tyson over in uh, over at Clemson. So, right. You know. yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. They're no, from North Carolina. G1, so you got to get one jeans. Yep. Yep. <laughs> he actually shot just as many threes as he did twos this year. Um, it had a shot at 172 threes, 185 twos, um, and had 118.9 offensive rating, which for those that don't know is just otherworldly good. Yep. Um, and again, on Belmont with Dia. Um, yep. so I just want all the Belmont players. There's another Belmont player in there too. I'm actually kind of interested in. Um, I think his name is Jacoby, yep. Jacoby Gillespie, yep. Gillespie, who's also somebody that Indiana has reached out to. He's interesting for me. Um, I, he he's more of like a combo guard, um, and the, he's the lead guard for that team. I think also the leading scorer on that team, if I remember yeah. correctly. Um, very good player. Um, I mean, I, I you brought him up earlier. I really like Leland Walker. Yeah. Um, I he he's rough around the edges though. Um, there's he averaged 15 points per game at Kentucky Eastern Kentucky. Um. And had 107.1 offensive rating, but his plus minus is not that great. Mm. Um, which to me spells that you know maybe defensively he's not that good, but also that could you know that's plus minus is a weird stat, right? Because it's like, yeah, it is. It's more about the team success than it is about your personal success. And if you're in roster or you're in lineups where there's you know you're playing bad defense you're going to have a negative offensive ratings or negative plus minus so i don't know if you can read into that but he's a guy that can finish with both hands um in and around the rim like good three-point shooter on catch and shoots which is again something that that you're, you're looking at for indiana again if you're if you're looking to partner two guards with galloway right and make galloway the primary ball handler then you want two guards that are good at catch and shoot threes or at least if you're going to play through the post again like you're going to feed renew and then you're going to let mbako kind of go down low this year mm -hmm. right and you're going to play a little bit smaller but you're still going to play through the post both those guys are going to look to kick out when they get doubled 
right? And so again, you're going to want guards that are good at catch and shoot threes. I think Leland, Connor Hickman, um, I believe Cade Tyson fits yeah. that. And again, Cade Tyson, six, seven. I think his is pretty good at that too. As, I don't know what CG the numbers and, say, but I feel like when I've watched, he's been he's been effective in that role. Asijian is effective in that role. His stats don't look that great right now just because of how he weird, was used weird at season. weird season. It's a bit CJ Gunlike, right? Kind of in a sense. Yeah, it is very CJ Gunlike, yeah. but he had his freshman year. Like we right. kind of saw how he was used right. and how he was balling. And if you get that guy even just a little bit of confidence, like yeah. he can ta- absolutely take over a, a season for a team, not just a game, he can take over a season, right? And, and, that's a guy I'm I'm looking at. Javon Small, I brought him up before. Yep. 37% three-point shooter, 163 attempts. Yep. Average 15.1 points per game at Oklahoma State, by the way. Power 5 program, Indiana guy from Indianapolis. You know, I, I've seen Kansas fans want him. I've seen Gonzaga fans want him. I think that's basically all I really need to say. <laughs> I mean, those teams are both known for having, you know, as of recent, having really good guards and being able to go in the transfer portal and get, grab guards that work. Um, I don't see why that would be a, any different for Javon Small at Indiana. Um, and Marquez Warwick is my last one. Mm. Um, he's a guy that, that the staff has seriously reached out to. Average about 19.9 points per game at Northern Kentucky, mm-hmm. another Kentucky school. Um, 107 offensive rating. Only shot 29% from three, but he chucked up 208 threes this year which is might be the most on this list outside of, I think, Trey Dinkins from Canisius. But, he, I mean, he's a guy that can absolutely get shots up, and if you need somebody to come in um, and take a heavy load from a, a guard scoring perspective, I don't see why that 19.9 couldn't, you know, it's going to fall down when you go to a, a power five level, but I don't, I don't think it'll fall that far below 14, 15 points per game. Um, and it, you know, an instant 14, 15 points into this offense would be wonderful. And again, he's yeah. six, two, he's a sizable right. combo guard. He can do everything. He's a scoring guard. He can pass the ball really well. Uh, I think he has like a, a 20% assist rate or something mm-hmm. like that. Um, very, very, very yeah. good guard, um, out of Northern Kentucky. They, they keep spawning. These guys just <laughs> like, they, they, they're doing so well at the mid-major level. Um, I will just let people know like stats are one thing and I can spat out statistics all I want. Mm -hmm. But the most important thing is when you go and look at these guys game logs, how do they do against tournament teams? Like against really good teams, how do they perform? Connor Hickman was very good for Bradley against some very good teams. Um, So was Cade Tyson for Belmont. Um, who had some really yep. good shooting performances against some really good teams. I think that's more indicative to me than just how they did overall in the season. Because, you know, you could look at somebody like Marquez Warren, mm-hmm. who's putting up numbers in Northern Kentucky. But, you yep. know, if he ha- has really bad games against high major opponents, what makes you think he can go to a high major team and do really well? Yeah, um, he did. He did struggle at Washington this past season, but had yep. a nice bounce back game at Cincinnati. Kind of a middle of the road game at St. Mary's. So, yeah, you know, a little bit of a, a wide variety of things there. Uh, of course, the Horizon League, uh, similar to maybe at a lesser level than the Missouri Valley, still like a very uh, competitive. Uh, Both of them are very good leagues. Both mid major conference. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so you know, it's not like you know we're digging at the very very bottom of the barrel. Uh, Northern Kentucky's a pretty. Uh, dangerous competitive basketball team i think they were the preseason favorites in the horizon league Um, and this doesn't even get into a couple of guys that just put their name in the ring right we talked about tony perkins with iowa through lawrence uh central north central lawrence lawrence north lawrence north that's lawrence north yeah uh and then we've got jalen blackman right of course marion and yep stetson and he had a stop in grand canyon along the way I, I I would like to 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 step up and talk about Jalen Blackman because I've seen he's, a lot of people be like he averaged twenty points per game, blah 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 blah. He's gonna come into IU and instantly be good. All right, I want you guys to go watch Stetson's round one game against UConn and watch him absolutely get bullied. I like Jalen Blackman a lot. He's a baller. And I six think three. He's, some, he's six three and he's somebody that can come in 
and play really well for Indiana and give, you know, a bit of an offensive punch that we haven't really had from the guard position since what Yogi left. Right. Gosh. Maybe Armand Franklin. Yeah. Yeah. Hood, Hood Shafita for, for what? Six, well, Hood, eight weeks? Hood, yeah. Hood Shafita for eight weeks. Yeah, I guess. But we haven't had, we've had in bits and pieces since Yogi Ferrell, right? Uh, since 2015, since our last serious tournament team. Um, I would be cautionary towards Jalen Blackman. Um, but I think if the staff could sell him on coming off the bench and mm. kind of like a Lou Williams' role where he plays... 20 minutes a game and and he's out there and he's his job is just to get buckets like i i think he would absolutely murder it in that role i just don't know if the staff can promise him starting minutes when there's so many other really good guards in the portal that could do so many different things like i'm sitting here trying to imagine a lineup where you have connor hickman right i'm already penciling him, him in by the way yeah. you have Connor Hickman, I mean, Galloway, on Wood, but like, come on! If if, yeah. if Woodson misses on Connor Hickman, we've got we've got a whole different podcast. We got we got yeah we got problems. Uh, Connor Hickman, Cade Tyson, uh, Galloway, Renu, and Baco. Like, you've got Renu down low. You can't double on him on that lineup because you've got Mbako on the perimeter. Catch and shoot threes. We saw how he was at the end of the year, right? Doing that. I would I would love some, sure. by the way, some some analytical numbers on Mbako's second half of the season yeah. um, in Big Ten play, because that's where he really took a step up um and went from basically like a DNP to averaging like yeah. 15 points per game. Um and then you've got Trey Galloway, who's shown he can shoot the three, didn't shoot it very well last season but is, you know, a really good cutter and moves off the ball and, and a really, you know, able passer. And you get two 40% three-point shooters. Like, now you're talking. That that offense works. And, you know, you start moving guys around. You start running them off of screens. Like, there's so much you can do with that offense um, to make it so modern and so, so, like, black and white compared to, like, what, what it was – you know, last year where it's, you know, post ups and not a ton of movement, but you got, you got guards that can shoot. You're running them around baseline to baseline moving. Like I, I like that lineup a lot. Um, you know, you could even, you know, you don't get Cade. Let's say you don't get Cade Tyson. Right. But you go get a Leland Walker. You can do the same thing. Right. And, and I think that's, that's a more modern offense. I just don't know how Jalen Blackman fits into that, you know, because he doesn't play defense and yeah, that's, that's that's the big problem. I still want him on the roster. Right? I I I I, <laughs> like, I, I would I, love him on the roster. And Don't I'm get like, me wrong. I'm like, do what it takes to get this guy on your basketball team. We're still talking about a six three guard. We're talking about someone who's who's had a few years of seasoning in Division One basketball. Um, somebody who lit up UCF on the road for twenty six. Yeah. Um, all I'm saying is like, <laughs> whether it's yeah, what what's up. I was gonna say if our if our guard room goes <laughs> from Xavier Johnson cups <laughs> and a yeah. bunch of potato chips to you know Connor Hickman, Leland Walker, and and Gabe Cups and whoever right? Jalen Blackman you know, or Jalen Blackman or, or t- Tony Perkins <laughs> or whatever like the the upgrade is day. insanity yeah i mean it, i the, there's so many ways the portal could go but you have to i don't think you mentioned you have, Asian, right i, don't think I have mentioned or, or, or javon Asian, small right or javon small and, there's yeah. so many guys you go and grab from all over the place that can just be instant upgrades on this roster over what we've been dealing with at indiana for basically you know outside of the jalen hutchfino year last uh, two out of three years of the woodson there yeah it's been it's been rough um, and then you might ask, hey, what about the wing position? Um, and we did talk about a couple of guys that Indiana is in contact with that uh, that uh, would fit that need. Of course, we're curious to see what kind of contributions Ja'Kai Newton can make. I think we would probably call him a two more than a three at this point. But, um, you know, curious to see uh, how how that uh, develops. Of course, Michael Ajayi from 
Pepperdine is someone who might uh, who might potentially fit that. Kay Tyson, as Matt mentioned, Marcus Foster, Devo Davis could be an intriguing fit out there. Uh, but there are a couple of 2024 freshmen, incoming freshmen, that have been reported as far as visiting Indiana this week. And uh, Bryson Tucker, the top 30 prospect who committed to G League Ignite. And, well, unfortunately for Mr. Tucker. G League Ignite G-League exploded. Ignite. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, collapsed within itself and no longer. Would you say uh, the G League Ignite team pulled up Baltimore Bridge? Oh, man. Wow. <laughs> True, sort of. Yeah, they collapsed. Yeah, uh, yeah, and the and the cargo ship was the nil and the yeah, <laughs> yeah. And so, oh, this is so bad. It's no, not even twenty four hours no, since that no, happened. No, I'm sorry. No, I'm gosh. so sorry, everybody. This is bad. Very bad. Yeah, we're gonna. I, I had to. I was. I was given the. I was given the opportunity. But Bryson Tucker, as well as Diamant Blasi, couple of twenty four freshmen, highly regarded. Uh, there planning to visit Indiana this week. I believe reports are that uh, Bryson Tucker is actually on campus today. This is yeah, Tuesday. Is. So, you know, this is somebody who, uh, you know, has NBA in his sights, uh, could be kind of the Mackenzie Mbako of this year, uh, you know, as far as, hey, this is a guy who is unexpectedly available. Woodson brings him in and, and really, you know, very possibly follows the same path, the same blueprint as he followed with Mackenzie Mbako. You don't have to recreate the wheel there. Uh, not exactly an identical player, but, you know, similar in a lot of aspects. The interesting thing is Bryson Tucker was down to Michigan State and Kansas before he decided to go to G League Ignite. Michigan State and Kansas, I don't know how much they're uh, currently in the mix uh, for Bryson Tucker. So it would be awesome if Woodson could land Tucker quickly. Otherwise, of course, uh, one of the one of the big new pieces of news that sort of precipitated this conversation is Khalil Ware declaring for the draft. And Matt, you and I have talked about how Ware should have, in his best interest, in IU's best interest, in everyone's best interests, put his name into the ring as far as the NBA draft this upcoming uh, this upcoming cycle because this is recruiting ammo for Indiana. It was a it was a perfect chance for Ware to spend a year in Bloomington and move on to the next level. Uh, you don't have any reservations here, right? About Khalil Ware moving on, and then what you're seeing here is Indiana is not too interested in the prototypical five. I think there are a couple of key points of conversation there. But as you probably saw, Ware off to the NBA. Uh, your thoughts on that uh, on that decision? I mean, Mike Woodson and the staff did what we wanted them to do which was mm-hmm. to take well where from an afterthought at oregon to a lottery pick and there's a high chance that he has taken either late lottery or you know mid 15 20s in this next nba draft there's a very high likelihood that happens He's, he will be a first rounder um and again that is something you can sell to everybody um that comes into the you know the confines of assembly hall. I took this guy that went to Oregon, who's produced a lot of really good NBA players and a lot of NBA talent recently, and they couldn't figure it out with him. And I, I figured it out. I figured it out. Look what we did with, with Khalil where he became one of the, the best players in the country. Um, and, and are one of the best players in the big 10, obviously, you know, getting second team, all big 10 and yeah. averaging close to 20 points per game. He was incredible for the Hoosiers, and and he'll be sorely missed. But at the same time, uh, you know, go get that bag. And so I'm I'm happy for him. By the way, speaking of of NBA players, if you have not watched Diamant Blazy mm-hmm. highlights, and that that dude is insane, insane. He he moves like like no other human I I have ever watched. Um. Because he's a six foot eight guard who's apparently has a 40 plus inch vertical and has a seven two wingspan. That that dude is is length incarnate um from the guard position. Um he would be fascinating. Now he's very under recruited and he came over from France, mm-hmm. I believe. Mm-hmm. But he's a guy that I, I'm looking at and I'm like damn bro like if you can you can get him and have him commit 
to staying and developing at Indiana under this staff, who knows? Who knows what he does? But, you know, I, at the same time, we're going to talk about him in a second. I thought Caleb Banks had that same kind of potential, and we didn't see that out of him <laughs> at all. Um, or, or at least in, in very small bits and spurts at Indiana. So I don't really know about that. I was just perusing Twitter earlier and I found out about the, what's the other guy's name that's visiting the Bryce Tucker. Bryce Tucker. Yeah. So he's a five-star, four-star, depending where you're looking at him. That guy screams Tamar Bates to me. I don't know what it is about that guy, but I, I watch him play and it screams Tamar Bates. Now, there was good Tamar and bad Tamar, and Tamar now is actually a pretty good player. Yeah. Um, but again, uh, he looks at me like a guy that needs a couple of years um, to develop. And I, I've been saying this for a while, and I'll stand on this. And and Ant and I share the same opinion on this. This twenty four class sucks. They suck. They are really bad, um, just from top to bottom. And so again, these guys coming in and possibly getting. You know, a scholarship offer is great, but what is the staff promising them? That's what's the what vision? I'm, what's the vision? I'm worried about, you know, what kind of promises they are going to keep um, or, or you know, put down on the table to get these guys in the door. Because if you're, if you're asking either of these guys to play significant minutes this coming season, I don't know how good that is for Indiana basketball. Like, I, I don't think... You know, uh, T Tucker. I don't think Tucker's a, a a starter right now at any p power five or or any uh, high major team. Yeah, right. I I don't know. I don't know if if even Blazy is uh, a a starter at a no, at an even mid major team right now. Um, but that's a you two know, year. I think that's a two year two year plan. Yeah, exactly. These guys, which is even, fine. These but. guys need to sit and develop, but with the era of the transfer portal, how many of them are going to want to sit and actually develop for two years at a program like Gabe Cups is, right? So I, we'll see um, what happens with those guys. I, I, I'm paying way more attention to the transfer guys because those are the guys mm -hmm. that are going to have, you know, the most immediate impact upon, you know, getting in the program. Yeah, lots for us to go through here. Indiana will continue to do what they have to do in the transfer portal. What that will likely not entail is going after CJ Gunn, Caleb Banks, or Peyton Sparks. Because they're gone. We'll talk about that in a second. But first, it's time for Who Won the Week this past week in IU Sports. And we have to tip our cap to the Indiana women's basketball team, who is a bit nervy. It's a bit stressful. It's a bit tenuous. Yeah. yeah. The entire 40 minutes honestly felt like a Big Ten game against another, you know, top 15, top 20 team. Uh, we've seen those. How many have we seen over the last couple of, uh, last, what, for three, four, five seasons, right? It feels like Indiana has about five or six of those types of games every year. Um, and it, it felt the exact same way on Monday night, uh, except everything was on the line and the Hoosiers got through it. They avenged the defeat to Miami from a year ago. Mackenzie Holmes was unbelievable. Once again, the post-game celebrations were incredible. Indiana's uh, women's basketball team punctuated a perfect home season and uh, did Assembly Hall right the final game on campus uh, this season in that arena. Uh, the Hoosiers got the win over the Oklahoma Sooners, and uh, it was rather comfortable <laughs> when it was all said and done. Indiana somehow turned it up over the last, what, like two, three minutes? And ended up pulling away for a seven-point win. And now the Hoosiers' reward is to face undefeated, number one, number one overall, number one everything, South Carolina, Friday night at 5 in Albany on ESPN. Um, obviously, South Carolina is better. There's no question about that. Um, but I think Indiana makes this one close, down to the finish, if not gets the win. I, I think Indiana at least has everyone tuning in across the college basketball universe for the last two or three minutes of this game. So I don't yep. know if Indiana is going to get the job done. It will be an MVP arena in Albany, New York, where the Hoosiers men's team beat Kent State last year before losing to Miami. So 
uh, maybe the men's team, the women's team can exchange, uh, you know, some ideas of how to keep yourself entertained in freaking Albany. Uh, but look, that's how it is for this women's team. Third Sweet 16 in four years. Terry Morin's established a juggernaut. We're going to talk a little bit more about her later on in this episode. But that's uh, that's clearly, clearly the team we have to go to as far as who won the week this past week in IU sports. And an important reminder, folks, if you enjoy our show, this part is important. Leave us a review, tell a friend, share our links. That kind of support really helps us grow this podcast and reach more passionate IU fans such as yourself. Matt, the three players that hit the portal, you got to have some outgoing guys. In addition to Khalil Ware moving on to the NBA, CJ Gunn, Caleb Banks, Peyton Sparks, Sparks has already committed back to Ball State for former Hoosier Michael Lewis. No surprise there. Uh, as you think about CJ Gunn and Caleb Banks, Matt, where where did it go wrong? Do you think it was more on the players or more on the staff? Do you think the blame should be split there? And then what do you expect from those two players this upcoming season? I think it's more on the staff. Because um, you get a guy who's 6'8", wing who we hear is a walking bucket um and then he doesn't really get the chance to play and when he did play honestly towards the end of last year he came in and gave indiana really good minutes um and and at the beginning of this year as well you know in, in short spurts in some big games he would come in and indiana needed you know some defense um and somebody to like i don't know just plug and play and offense he gave indiana some decent minutes at times it's just it never clicked with him you know either it was a rush three here or was out of control here or a quick two fouls here like i he he just never he just never fit and then you also look at the way they're trying to play basketball and they look at the roster that's constructed he never really made it past second base right like he was he was always choice yeah. number two or three during his time here. And that really sucks because he's a guy that needed minutes in basketball. He was a when he when he committed, you know, people were talking about how he's kind of rough around the edges and you know, as a you know, a guy that's gonna need a couple years to develop. Well, guys need a couple years to develop, but they also need playing time during those couple of years, right? Like guys need to see the floor. And he didn't really get to see the floor as much as he probably needed to. And so this is a good move for him, you know, ending up, you know, prob- hopefully transferring down a level um, and getting some serious playing time and getting some shots. Cause he's a guy that has NBA type, you know, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking upside. for? Upside. Upside. Yeah. And, and measurables. Like he, he's a guy that, you know, the NBA teams kind of salivate over when you're, you're six foot eight, you don't know if you're a guard or you're a forward. Um, should be able to shoot the three and put the ball on the floor. Athletic as hell. Like that's that's a guy that teams kind of like you know that's the instant draft pick right in in, in the second round from a guy that's coming from the mid major like and and can hopefully with correct development you know become a guy that can contribute on on a team. Uh, and I think Banks still has that potential. He just needs playing time which is also probably going to be the same thing that I say for the other two guys. They needed playing time. Mike Woodson cut his rotation short, and those were the guys that kind of got the uh, short end of the stick. I'm really surprised it did not work out with, with either player. Mm-hmm. Um, this this was part of – I mean, I know CJ Gunn committed to Archie Miller, but you went into Woodson's second year – and it was CJ gone and it was Caleb Banks and it was Jalen Hood Shafino. You know, once Parker Stewart moved on, it was like, okay, behind Xavier Johnson, um, behind Malik Renu, behind Trace, you've got a couple of these guys that are really intriguing prospects. Yeah. And there were moments where it worked, but there were just far too many, too many situations where it didn't. And it was so weird, personally, at the end of that Nebraska game in the Big Ten tournament. To see CJ Gunn put on his put on his shooting shoes, and the last ten minutes of that Big Ten tournament game against Nebraska, you're like, if you didn't want to, 
you know, if you wanted to run an up-tempo offense with someone taking shots in quick time, uh, you know, there's something there. Like, you can see that the shooting form is smooth. You can see that the two-way ability uh, can can pop off the screen. But like you were saying, Matt, just too many, too many moments where there were struggles, there were weaknesses, uh, fouling three-point shooters, getting beat uh, defensively. You know, and then you ask, okay, from a rebounding assisting standpoint, how much more did he contribute? It was it was very disappointing to me. It was inevitable, but it was still disappointing to see Gunn and Banks put their names in the portal. I hope both of them go to a mid-major level and get 30 I, minutes a game. I want Gunn to follow Sparks. I Dude, want him on Ball That would State. be perfect. Yeah, perfect. Absolutely perfect. Go to Ball State. Caleb Banks can follow out. too. Yes. Yes. Yeah, all three of them could could absolutely ball out at uh, IU North Northeast, you know? I don't know if uh Banks wants to go back to uh to where it's closer to home, but if he wants to stay in the area, you know. Like I could I could see Banks going to like a Charleston or uh Ooh, that's a really good fit. That's a very good program. It's a very good it's program. A very it's, good program. It's close to home. Like, you know, I, there's a lot of, you know, decent programs down there in the South that, that are good at Furman. Like you oh, yeah. can go, you can go down there and, and find a spot, hopefully at a, you know, at a mid-major level, but like a high mid-major level. This is not mm-hmm. like he's not going to, to Stetson. Um, but right. you know, like, a, a, a true mid major, you know, people that can make some noise in March and have good seasons and exactly. and put on a show and get a little bit more TV time than a stats in might. But you know, like I, I think there's a good fit. And I didn't even touch on CJ Gunn, but I, I thought there was always a player there. I just too many cooks in the kitchen, right? Too many too many cooks in the kitchen for at that guard spot for Indiana. You got to play cups. Because you know you needed that second or Cups third ball handler. He produced. Yeah, like, Xavier Johnson when he was healthy needed to play. Can't, can't ignore. Uh, yeah. Leal stepped up as the season stepped went up. on, and and he's a. I I think CJ Gunn is a collateral damage. Yep. Of what happened to Leal this year, and as the season went on, because as the season went on, CJ's minutes went down, Leal's minutes went up because yep. Leal is. A, much more mature player, yep. better defensively, was much more consistent shooting the ball, yep. and is is a significantly better team basketball player than CJ yep. Gunn is at this moment yep. because he's two years a senior. So, again, there's just too many people there for him to get minutes, and it's the same reason why he transferred out because guess what? It's not going to change next year when you go get two new guys at least – at the guard position, right? And you're playing those guys. And Cups is still there and is still going to get minutes at the point guard position. And then you're going to have to play Leo next year because of what he showed last year and just his skill set overall and him being much older. Mm-hmm. CJ's not going to play. So it, it makes it makes so much sense that they left. It just sucks yeah. that they had to. You know and that's the problem. That's the problem with college basketball these days because back in the day – Right, CJ would be looking for a. This is a guy that could have a breakout season his <laughs> senior year. Right, he's been waiting for this yeah, opportunity. Senior, senior, yeah. Right, and you're sitting there waiting. You know, you're you're building a roster and you're you're putting these chess pieces together so they all line up correctly. And maybe you go get one transfer, but you know you're not getting half your roster from the transfer portal. Right, whereas Indiana this year has seven scholarships open. <laughs> right, out of thirteen. So yeah. more than half are going to be transfers or at least a, a late stage commit from a, from a, a senior in high school. It, there's not really spots on this roster anymore for three and four stars. Where when we started this podcast, we used to used to preach, go get those in-state three and four stars and develop them so they can have a breakout party their junior year. Well, the, uh, between us, you know, I I started this podcast in 2016, 2017. In mm-hmm. the last seven years, college basketball has done a complete 180. Like, it is so different now, the way you build rosters as compared to when I started this podcast. Yeah. Um, and then Nithin joined. Like, yeah. there's the, 
Madness. The landscape of college basketball is so different, and it's hurt guys like C.J. Gunn. But it's also at the same time given them the ability to go and fix that and, and have a, a opportunity to play high level basketball still at a school that's you know beneath the level that they probably should be playing in their junior and senior year. Uh, by the way, as we we're talking here, Michael Ajayi, the Pepperdine transfer that we talked about earlier, as someone Gonzaga. who was in contact with, off to Gonzaga. So we can cross that name off of Indiana's list. He's one of the few guys IU could have seen uh, fit into that wing role. Um, and you're talking about building rosters. Uh, Gonzaga's a team that's usually been a get in and develop and get better type of program. Uh, now you raid, uh, you raid the roster of your, of your conference uh, rivals. And uh, find their best players. Just speaking of so. speaking of rivals, breaking news: What's that? John Calipari is returning as <laughs> as Kentucky's head coach next year. So that should be funny right, to watch. So I'll take the fifteen again uh, next year in the first round. Uh, let's oh let's take. Uh, I'm thinking. I'm thinking. Uh, I'm thinking. Chicago State next year gets. Uh, gets That's Kentucky. spicy. That's Southern spicy. Southern Indiana, right? Right yeah. across the border. Yeah. 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 yeah, you guys can. Can I bet? Can I bet? Uh, Valpo, the, the, I'm taking the double digit seed. Actually, no, I'm I'm taking. Valpo's got problems. No, no, uh, I'm I I'm taking I'm taking I'm taking CJ Gunn and and Ooh. Caleb Banks and the uh, Mac <laughs> and Champs. Sparks, the Mac Champs, Ball State. Okay, they go I like a miracle that. run in March. They make it in late, and then the, as a 14 yeah. seed, beat Kentucky. That's well, Michael gonna... Lewis, right? You yeah. know, let's go. Yeah. I mean, here's what I'm thinking, right? And then we'll talk about the the women's team here in just a second. Um, let's let's have a little collab here, okay? So Indiana brought yes, in so Peyton Sparks, right? And and now Sparks is back at Ball State. So how about CJ Gunn goes to Ball State, figures it out for a year, and then we sit in March 2025, saying, "Welcome back, CJ. You're a seasoned, refined guard now. Welcome to the show." <laughs> I'm not. I I think that's gonna can't happen. burn bridges. Can't burn bridges. That's gonna happen a lot. Like it's genuinely like people find it funny that that somebody could transfer from one program to another. Might happen um, to Michi Johnson potentially. I mean, it could potentially happen to Michi Johnson. Uh, look at um, I'm, I'm trying to think. Ali Ali from uh, Ooh, Akron, right? Akron, yeah. Transfers goes to Butler, stinks it up for a season at Butler. Goes back. Is all conference in the MAC and they make March. Um, <laughs> you, you can see it happening at a lot of different places where these guys they leave, coaches keep in contact, they make sure they're okay, you know, yeah, checking check out his family, yeah, doing. exactly. You keep those bridges, yeah, intact. We intact, a lot of bridge, upright. A lot of bridge talk on here today. Ah, right? God, just I keep wanting to say the joke and I can't say it. I already did it. Um, but you know, you, you want to keep those relations open just in case the player has a bit of a breakout, right? And yeah. and kind of develops into the player that you originally recruited him to become. I mean, if if Tamar Bates enters the portal, Indiana should go after him like 100 this, this yes. month, yeah. Yes. Like, I'm not kidding. So, no, that's not a joke. <laughs> like, so that's, you know, that's not a joke. Yeah, like no. De Dennis Gates looked like looks like he is staying on at Missouri. Uh, they've gotten one or two guys uh, since the portal opened. So they they should be able to bounce back next year. But if Kamar Bates wanted to uh, return, I don't think he's going to do that. But if he wanted to, um, I think that would be something I would I would want Mike Woodson to pursue ASAP. Oh my God, the scenes, the scenes of IU Twitter, if. If our first commit from the portal yeah. is a the big first. man, oh, is a big, big man, big. Oh. and then you follow that up with Tamar Bates, oh my god, oh my god, I would that would be that would be perfect. That would, that would be that would be cinema, as the, the kids say these days. <laughs> that would be wild. Um, I don't think so. I think the first first commit will be Connor Hickman, uh, minus I uh, minus eight hundred. Uh, uh, I just I don't see how the staff. Lets him in the door again, like, and then doesn't kidding. lock him in assembly if, hall. Yeah, like honestly, exactly. Yes, like, it, 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 Jordan uh, Halls is on the staff. Like yes, yes. Anthony Leal's on the roster. 
If you screw this up, nobody should have it, your job. It, I, I need to do some research. But and I'm, again, Hickman may not play more than 15, 20 minutes a game for Indiana next year, but that doesn't matter. You got an old shooter who's been really important for a team like Bradley, Bloomington South guy, bring him in, start filling up your roster. Spot. He's the yes. leading scorer for Bradley. Very good team. A very, very good big major. You don't let him leave the building. And, and he's visiting within what three, four days of that announcement. So. I, I, I know. I remember uh, Trey Galloway talking about in his senior speech how he was going to um, do some tampering, right, mm-hmm. and, and do his best to bring people to Bloomington. I'm pretty sure. Play the game, I'm baby. I'm pretty sure him and Leal, him being Trey, yeah. Trey and Leal are very good friends with Connor Hickman. Don, he's not leaving that building without committing this weekend. <laughs> it's not happening. There's no rule that says you have to take multiple visits. Also, by the way, I have heard through the grapevine that Indiana has somewhere between three, four, or five million dollars in NIL funds for this transfer portal season. Now, of course, a, a, a portion of that has to go to locking up Mbaco, and yeah. I'm sure some have already gone to Renew and Galloway and Leo sure. and everybody else is on the roster. But I'm pretty sure IU can compete with anybody when it comes to dropping a bag. Um, so when people are talking about whether, you know, this guy is looking for an NIL deal or not, that should not be an issue for Indiana. That's it's like a top 10, top five-ish sort of, you know, transfer portal budget as far as what, you know, I've heard. Um, and And this is just, you know, between us and the podcast, mm-hmm. but I have heard that uh, Doug McDaniel asked for seven hundred fifty thousand dollars in NIL from Maryland, who Ooh. was like, "We don't have that money." Um, but you know who does? Ooh. Okay. Anyways, Ken Nunn. Ken, <laughs> Ken Nunn. Yeah, it's all those. It's it's all the bus billboards are finally paying mm-hmm. off for the Indiana basketball program. That's right. Yeah. There you go. Hey, you I, know, Trace, I read, I Trace, read, uh, Trace is going to get an extension in a couple of years. I'll tell you that. Much. And Trace, Trace very well could become he's, a He's going to get a nice um, read deal coming up soon. We got to figure out what Old Depot's doing. He needs a, once his, one of the albums go platinum, you know. Eric um, Gordon keeps getting Eric, contracts. Hey, Eric Gordon's pizza shop might pay for a couple <laughs> players. Um, But no, what was I reading today? I I was reading something about there's an IU donor that really is becoming the GM of NIL for Indiana. I don't remember his name. Um, Let's see if we can get that here. But there's there's some sort of billionaire that's from Indiana that's a big IU basketball fan that's been giving a lot of money just towards the NIL that's getting these players, and that's why they have such a fund right now. To go and get these guys, I don't remember his name, but I would recommend yeah, look it you guys... up. See if you can find it. Before yeah, we, I'm gonna I'm gonna look it up and see up. if I can find it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, this is our chance to hop over to our social media shout out and then talk about the IU women's basketball team here, folks. If you like what you're hearing, or even if you don't, find us on social media on Twitter, Facebook, or YouTube at Indiana HQ. Then on Instagram, we're not Indiana HQ, but where are we? indiana.hq you can find us there leave us uh you know leave us a comment a like a reply a retweet whatever you feel like doing subscribe to our stuff if you have not already Um, i did see on social media by the way that iu football coach kurt signetti for about a minute or two spoke very fondly of the iu women's team and the job that terry morin has done uh mason williams over at MVSON Williams tweeted it out earlier today. It's like a minute clip of not just, oh, hey, congrats to Terry Morin and the Indiana women's team. He he went into a little bit more detail about the type of competitive aspects that he saw from the women's team, uh, the ups, the way they managed the ups and downs of that game against Oklahoma, uh, the competitive fight, that finishing kick that they had to pull away. After 35, 36, 37 minutes of intense competition, uh, we've said this once or twice before, but Indiana football has a blueprint for success, and it's the Indiana women's basketball program. They were in shambles for decades. 
It was an afterthought at IU. Nobody would go to their games. They would lose a lot. They were they weren't getting too much uh, high positive PR. And then Terry uh, Kirk, Kurt Miller came through uh, a little bit from the end of the Felicia Leggett Jack tenure. Um, and now you're seeing Terry Moore really elevated to a really premier level. Um, the Hoosiers have an avenue. They have a path to succeeding in football. And uh, I was happy to see Kurt Signetti at the game yesterday because if he can get any lessons from the women's basketball team, that will only be good news for IU football in the Absolutely. future. So make sure you find that video video that Mason Williams tweeted out at MBS, the one Williams. He also, uh, Mason also just does a really good job of covering IU sports. So by the way, add him to your list. I figured it out. Great it's, Will, it's William Cook. Ooh. Why the, he's why the practice facility is called Cook Hall. Let, let William Cook. Yeah, he's he's a Bloomington guy. He lives in Bloomington, yeah. but he's a billionaire. So, um, let me, let me uh, he's been giving a lot of money towards NIL like crazy. Um, so you got him to thank if we have a really good roster next year. Uh, you gotta that's how you gotta win the uh win the win the arms race right now in college basketball. Life is different than it was three or four or five years ago. No question about it. Uh Matt, we talked about the women's team, the official victory over Oklahoma in the round of 32. Indiana won 75-68, avenged the loss from last year. Mackenzie Holmes was sensational. I know you were paying attention to that game yesterday. It was intense. It was tight. The Hoosiers got the win. I mean, you're seeing people now on social media engage with our account more for women's basketball than really men's basketball or football is concerned. Like, yeah. what do you think that win meant to IU as a whole? Meant to Mackenzie Holmes' legacy, Terry Morin, Sydney Parrish, Sarah Scalia. This is a hell of a team, and we're watching them do their best at the end of the season. I mean, it's actually been a bit since IU's been good, as good as the women's team has been consistently mm -hmm. in basketball and men's. Yeah. And so this is the kind of feverish hype that Indiana men's basketball would have if they, you know, got their shit together. Yeah. But, you know, they it's a team that fights for the name. I know this is going to such sound so booberish of me, but fights for the name on the front of the jersey, right? They, they legitimately they do. They they yeah. they kick and claw scratch and scratch, and, and they'll do whatever it takes to win for that name on the front of the jersey. And they do it as a team, like it's everybody contributing. You know, it's whether it's Jordan or it's McKenzie yeah. or it's Sarah or yeah. it's Sydney you know, Parish, Chloe, Sydney Parish, or yeah, it's. Whether you, know, I could go through like half the damn roster, right? But they, they did yesterday. Uh, Terry Moore went through half the roster yesterday. She was right off yeah. the top of her head, she knew she she knows what's up. She does know what's what's up, and they play together as a team, and they're very fun to watch. And they play with a, a grit, but also with a little bit of joy mixed in there. Like they all enjoy playing with each other, and that's so much fun to watch. And it's honestly been something that's missing from the men's team for quite a bit. Um, because at times it doesn't look like the team likes playing with each other. So it's a it's a real nice change of pace. And I think that's why people are really gravitating towards them. And also, women's basketball is on the come up. I mean, legitimately it is. Oh, it's for sure. Uh, for sure. It is blowing up week by week. Um, and there's so many, it's so fun to watch and follow. It's a little bit it's it's still basketball, but it's just a completely different brand of basketball from the NBA to men's to now the women's and then the WNBA. Yeah. It's, it's got its own unique flavor and, and people are really gravitating towards it and, and really like it. And I'm really happy that that's happening. I love, I love men's basketball. I really do. I mean, I think men's basketball is, is, is awesome. I, I watch more men's college basketball than I probably watch any other sport. Um, but right now the women's game has way more star power. It just does. You just, yep. you know the names, you know about Caitlin Clark, you know about Juju Watkins, you know about Cam Brink. You, of course, know about Mackenzie Holmes if you're listening to I this love podcast. Cam Brink. Uh, you know about Paige Beckers, you know about uh, Hannah Hidalgo. Uh, by the way, Indiana might face Hannah Hidalgo if they upset South Carolina on uh, on set, on uh, Friday. Of yep. course, that game against Notre Dame would potentially be on Sunday, a rematch of an NCAA tournament game from a few years ago. Uh, you just, you know the names. 
And, uh, you know, there's not as much transferring. There is definitely a good amount, right? You saw that with the Angel, uh, Angel Reese's teammate, ha Haley Van Lith, this past season, uh, going from Louisville to LSU. But, like, the star power is incredible and the crowds are awesome. I thought it was <laughs> – I was watching the women's tournament over the last couple of days and I was like, it would be kind of fascinating if the men's tournament was formatted in the same way where <laughs> – you had home games, home games for, for the, the, the top for the, seeds, the top four seeds in each region, because what I noticed yesterday, especially watching, you know, because on Monday night you had standalone games really for the women's tournament all day because uh, there's no men's basketball going at the same time. There is incredible pressure on the home team in the round of 32 because yeah. everyone's there. It's a packed house and the team you're facing is really good. And they're trying to make sure their season continues. So whether it was Caitlin Clark's home game at Iowa or NC State uh, at home yesterday or UConn fighting through former Hoosier coach Felicia Leggett Jack in Syracuse, like these home teams face so much pressure in this round of 32 game. It almost doesn't make sense when you think about it logically, but then you watch and you go, wow, every time – uh, 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 an Iowa player missed a shot yesterday, an Indiana player missed a shot yesterday, UCLA player missed, missed a shot yesterday. The crowd felt the pressure. Yeah. <laughs> they gave it right back. Yeah. And then meanwhile, the top 25 team that you're playing on the other end of the court, they're just taking advantage of it. They're running back up and down the court, playing freely, playing in transition, almost as if they had nothing to lose. I mean, it would have been absolutely hilarious if we, uh, if we had gotten, I don't know, a Marquette Colorado uh, game in Milwaukee uh, in Pfizer Forum where where the Golden Eagles play or uh, or or James Madison heading to Cameron Indoor for the round of 32 the round of 32 game like uh you know how how unusual would that have been or having uh Grand Canyon go to uh go to Alabama I think that would have been a pretty uh pretty funny set of circumstances or you would have gotten uh Yale San Diego State scenario where neither team was the home team <laughs> in that situation. Yes. And yes. you just play that game in front of a crowd of like 200 people. So it would have been really funny. I can't wait to see this IU San Diego State game on Friday. I know Indiana's going to go in as a significant underdog. I would expect it to be double digits uh, going into this game in Albany, but the Hoosiers have beaten South Carolina fairly recently. Mackenzie Holmes uh, was on that roster. Um, Mackenzie Holmes, Sydney Parrish, Chloe Moore McNeil, they are going. They're not going to go down without a fight. When South Carolina hits 70% from three, then you're cooked anyway. But I think this one's going to be interesting down to the finish. I love that 5 p.m. Friday start right after folks get home from school or work. Let's go. Let's make it happen. Um, Matt, you know, Mackenzie Holmes, Terry Moore, and I know Indiana doesn't retire numbers. Um, statues are coming, right? Yeah, yeah, they better be. They be. I mean, Terry Morton has taken this program from basically. Like, I will say Kurt Miller had one or two good seasons. It's almost like Tom Allen, like Tom Allen in a sense, right? Like he had one or two good years, but he just couldn't consistently get that strong performance. Terry Morton's doing that. So you're saying Coach Signetti is mm -hmm. Terry Morton? You know, it wouldn't shock me. And again, I, I'm not I, saying that would be the least shocking thing ever. I'm not I, saying top five, but like top 25. I'm not even coping when I, I have never been more confident in the Indiana football program than where I am at right now. Just, just to be safe, we'll probably bet on Florida international. To win the game. That's true. Yeah. That's a good point. Just a good point. <laughs> Matt, good point. as we, uh, as we wind down here, uh, the Hoosiers men's team doing a bunch of stuff as far as putting uh, their hat in the ring, as far as uh, over a dozen targets in the transfer portal. The women's team, obviously, basking in the glory of making the Sweet 16. And now they get a true neutral site game against South Carolina. It should be a fun one. Uh, any final thoughts on your end as we wrap up here on this Tuesday night? Go get the portals. Don't let Connor Hickman leave the building. No. I'm so excited for the women to play South Carolina. <laughs> I you know, South Carolina looks like a juggernaut, but I, I, I remember a time at which, you know, India's, uh, Indiana women's basketball program beat South Carolina. Yep. And it's neutral not very site. neutral site, not very long ago. So it's mm -hmm. possible. 
Um, and yeah, again, this game's at a neutral site. Um, I'm feeling good about the football program. I, given us the time to step back and think about this season for basketball and the football season, I feel very confident that Indiana athletics is taking a turn for the better um, as a whole. And I think the women's program is really helping with that. Um, baseball got off to a hot start, not hot that anymore. You know, soccer's still there. <laughs> the softball program's taking a turn yeah. to be for the better. Yeah. You know, I, I so think overall, awesome. the, the, the hockey team winning the D2 yeah. national yeah. championship. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot going on in Bloomington that's good. Um, volleyball is getting better. Um, there's a lot going on in Bloomington that's good, and, and I'm excited for the future. Um, I just, I'll be even more excited if we get some killers in the basketball program. But that's that's beside the point. Totally fair. Uh, you know, I think as I'm sitting here and looking at the men's Sweet 16, I just see so many teams that have really benefited uh, from the transfer portal and had very quick turnarounds. I mean, nobody was thinking about Illinois as a, as a final four contender, but Marcus Damask has made a major impact in that department coming over from Southern Illinois. Uh, you know, we're talking about, uh, you know, a team like Clemson, right? Who would have thought Clemson out of the ACC in the, in the sweet 16, uh, you know, and never mind Lance Jones's impact at Purdue, Graham EK's impact at Gonzaga. Uh, you're seeing a lot of high, high level basketball teams get fueled by one or two quality mid major transfers or high major transfers that come and over they all shoot and make a massive impact. I was, uh, and I was going to finish that conversation with Dalton Connect, right? Indiana was yeah. right in there until the last minute with Dalton Connect. But the Hoosiers maybe didn't have as clear as a path to playing time for Connect. So he went off to Tennessee because Indiana thought. Xavier Johnson and Trey Galloway were going to be the backcourt for 35 games this past season. That didn't happen. So you, you don't have any time to feel sorry for yourself. Indiana's goal should be to get back to the final four next year. I say get back for the first time since 2002. But like your goal's got to be, we got to build a final four level team. It doesn't matter how bad you were last year. The first step was getting the return from two key guys in Galloway and Renew. As you're doing the portal conversation here, get Mbako in an IU uniform next season. And, and and if that means you pay more for him and it maybe leaves a little bit less for the portal guys, that's fine. Mbako's not ready for the NBA. He needs a year. Give him a year and then put him in the pros just like you did with Khalil Ware. That's got to be the path. If Mbako comes back, you can't let him leave through the portal. You can't let him leave to the NBA. If he comes back, you fill in the gaps with portal guys, and then you rock and roll. And uh, and and again, you know, I think a Final Four run and the Elite Eight run is very, very much in the cards if Indiana does the next six weeks the best that they can get it. So, folks, that about wraps it up for our three hundred twenty fifth show of the Hoosier Sound. Thank you so much for your for joining us. We really appreciate your support. To hear more fantastic episodes like the one you heard today, be sure to follow us at Indiana HQ or at the Hoosier Sound. Find it all in one place. But as always, thank you for listening, Hoosier Nation. We will see you next time. Peace and love, Go Hoosiers.